this is more than the population of Europe. We protected our people with 2.2 billion doses of made in India COVID vaccines. And that too free cost. I may be running out of continent soon. So I will stop here. <laughs> Distinguished members, the Vedas are one of the world's oldest scriptures. They are a great treasure of humanity composed thousands of years ago. Back then, women's sages compose many verses in these Vedas. And today, in modern India, women are leading us to a better future. <laughs> India's vision is not just of development which benefits women. It is of women-led development, where women lead the journey of progress. A woman has risen from a humble tribal background to be our head of states. Nearly 1.5 million, 1.5 million elected women lead us at the various levels. And that is of local governments. Today, women serve our country in the Army, Navy, and Air Force. India also had the highest, highest percentage of women airline pilots in the world. And they have also put us on Mars by leading our Mars mission. I believe that Investigating in a girl child lifts up the entire family, empowering women, transform the nation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, India is an ancient nation with a youthful population. India is known for its traditions, but the younger generation is also making a hub of technology, be it creative reels on Insta or real-time payments. Coding or quantum computing, machine learning or mobile apps, fintech or data science, the youth of India are a great example of how a society can embrace the latest technology. In India, technology is not about innovation, but also about inclusion. Today, digital performance are empowering the rights and dignity of people while protecting, protecting privacy. In the last nine years, over a billion people got a unique digital biometric identity connected with their bank accounts, 
and mobile phones. This digital public infrastructure helps us reach citizens within seconds with financial assistance. 850 million people receive direct benefit financial transfers into their accounts. Three times a year, over a hundred million farmers receive assistance in their bank accounts at the click of a button. The value of such transfer has cross $320 billion. And we have saved over $25 billion in the process. If you visit India, you will see everyone is using phones for payments, including street vendors. Last year, out of every hundred real-time digital payments in the world, 46 happened in India. <laughs> Nearly 400,000 miles of political fiber, uh, optical fiber, optical fiber cables and cheap data have ushered in a revolution of opportunities. Farmers check weather updates. The elderly get social security payments. Students access scholarships. Doctors deliver telemedicine. Fishermen check fishing grounds and small businesses get loans with just a tap on their phones. Mr. Speaker, a spirit of democracy, inclusion, and sustainability defines us. It also shapes our outlook to the world. India grows while being responsible about our planet. We believe Mata Bhumihi Putro Aham Prutviya. This means the earth is our mother and we are her children. Indian culture deeply respects the environment and our planet. While becoming the fastest growing economy, we grew our solar capacity by 2,300 percent. Yes, you have heard right. 2,300 percent. We became the only only G20 country to meet its Paris commitment. We made renewables account for over 40 percent of our energy sources nine years ahead of the target of 2030. But we did not stop there. At the Glasgow summit, I propose mission life, lifestyle for environment. This is a way to make sustainable sustainability a true people's movement, to live it to be the job of governments alone by being mindful in making choices, every individual can make a positive impact. 
making sustainability a mass movement, we help the world reach the net zero target faster. Our vision is pro-planet progress. Our vision is pro-planet prosperity. Our vision is pro-planet people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we live by the motto of Vasudhaya Kutumkam or the world is one family. Our engagement with the world is for everyone's benefit. The one sun, one world, one grid seek to join us. All is connecting the world with clean energy. One Earth, One Health is a vision for global action to bring quality health care to everyone, including animals and plants. The same spirit is also seen in the theme when we chair the G20, One Earth, one family, one future. We advance the spirit of unity through yoga as well. Just yesterday, the whole world came together to celebrate the International Day of Yoga. Just last week, all nations join our proposal at the UN to build a memorial wall to honor the peacekeepers. And this year, the whole world is celebrating the International Year of Millets to promote sustainable agriculture and nutrition alike. During COVID, we delivered vaccines and medicines to over 150 countries. We reach out to others. Being disastrous as first respondents, as we do for our own, we share our modest resources with those who need them the most. We build capabilities, not dependencies. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when I speak about India's approach to the world, the United States occupy a special place. I know our, our relations are of great importance to all of you. Every member of this Congress has a deep interest in it. When defense and aerospace in India grow, industries in the state of Washington, Arizona, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and Pennsylvania thrive. When American companies grow their, their research and development centers in India thrive, when Indians fly more, a single order of air, for aircraft creates more than a million jobs in 44 states in America. When an American phone makers invest in India, 
it creates an entire ecosystem of jobs and opportunities in both countries. When India and U.S. work together on semiconductors and critical minerals, it helps the world in making supply chains more diverse, resilient, and reliable. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we were strangers in defense cooperation at the turn of century. Now, the United States has become one of our most important defense partners. Today, India and the U.S. are working together in space and in the seas, in science and in semiconductors, in startups and sustainability, in tech and in trade, in farming and in finance in art and artificial intelligence, in energy and education, in healthcare and humanitarian efforts. I can go on and go on, but to sum up it, why I would say the scope of our cooperation is endless. The potential of our synergy is limitless. And the chemistry in our relations is effortless. In all this, Indian Americans have played a big role. They are brilliant in every field not just in spelling B. <laughs> With their hearts and minds, talent and skills, and the love for America and India, they have connected us. They have unlocked doors. They have shown the potential of our partnership. Mr. Speaker, distinguished members, every Indian Prime Minister and American President of the past has taken our relationship further. But our generation has to honor of taking it a greater heights. I agree with President Biden that this is a defining partnership of this country. Because it serves a larger purpose, democracy, demography, and destiny give us the purpose. One consequence of globalization has been to cover over concentration of supply chains. We will work together to diversify, decentralize, and democratize supply chains. Technology will determine the security, prosperity, and leadership in the 21st century. That is why our two countries established a new initiative for 
critical and emerging technologies. Our knowledge partnership will serve humanity and seek solutions to the global challenges of climate change, hunger, and health. Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, the last few years have seen deeply disruptive developments. With the Ukraine conflict, war has returned to Europe. It is causing great pain in the region. Since it involves major powers, the outcomes are severe. Countries of the Global South have been particularly affected. The global order, order is based on the respect for the principle of the UN Charter. Peaceful resolution of disputes and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. As I have said directly and publicly, this is not an era of war. But it is one of dialogue and diplomacy. And we all must do what we can to stop the bloodshed and human suffering. Mr. Speaker, the dark clouds of coercion and confrontation are casting their shadow in the Indo-Pacific. The stability of the region has become one of the central concerns of our partnership. We share a vision of a free, open, an inclusive Indo-Pacific. Connected by secure seas, defined by international law, free from domination and anchored in ASEAN centrality. A region where all nations, small and large, are free and fearless in their choices, where progress is not suffo suffocated, by an impossible burdens of debt. <laughs> Where connectivity is not leveraged for strategic purposes. Where all nations are lifted by the high tide of shared prosperity. <laughs> Our vision does not seek to contain or exclude but to build a cooperative region of peace and prosperity. We work through regional institutions and with our partners from within the region and beyond. Of this, Ford had emerged as a major force of good for the region. Mr. Speaker, more than two decades after 
9/11 and more than a decade after 26/11 in mumbai radicalism and terrorism still remain a pressing danger for the whole world these ideologies keep taking new identity and forms but their intentions are the same terrorism is an enemy of humanity and that can be no ifs and buts in dealing with it we must overcome all such forces sponsoring and exporting terror <laughs> mr speaker covid 19's biggest impact was the human loss and suffering it caused i wish to remember congressman ron rights and the staff members who lost their lives to covid as we emerge out of the pandemic we must give a shape to a new world order consideration care and concern are the need of the hour giving a voice to the global south is the way forward that is why i firmly believe that the african union be given full membership of g20 we must revive multilateralism and reform multilateral institutions with better resources and representation that applies to all our global institutions of governance especially the united nations when the world has changed our institutions too must change or risk getting replaced by a world of rivalries without rules in working for a world new world order based on international law our two countries will be at the forefront as partners <laughs> mr speaker and distinguished members today we stand at a new dawn in our relationship that will not only shape the destiny of our two nations but also that of the world at the young american poet amoda gomen had expressed when day comes we step out of the shade a flame and an afraid the new dawn blooms as we free it for there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it our trusted partnership our trusted partnership is like the sun in this new dawn that we spread light all around Ooh. 
I am reminded of a poem that I once wrote. Asman me sir uthakar. Asman me sir uthakar. Ghane badalo ko cheer kar. Roshni ka sankalp le. Abhi to suraj uga hai. अभी तो सूरज उगा है दृढ़ निश्चय के साथ चलकर दृढ़ निश्चय के साथ चलकर हर मुश्किल को पार कर घोर अंधेरे को मिटाते घोर अंधेरे को मिटाने अभी तो सूरज उगा है If I were to say it in English, it would be rising its head in the skies, piercing through the dense clouds with the promise of light. The sun has just risen, armed with a deep resolve, overcoming all the odds. To dispel the forces of darkness, the sun has just risen. <laughs> Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, we come from different circumstances and history, but we are united by a common vision. And by a common destiny, when our partnership progresses, economic resilience increases, innovation grows, science flourishes, knowledge advances, humanity benefits, our seas and skies are safer, democracy will shine brighter, and the world. Will be better place. That is the mission of our partnership. That is our calling for this century, Mr. Speaker and distinguished members. Even by the high standards of our partnership, this visit is one of the great positive transformation. Together, we shall demonstrate that democracy is better and democracy is deliver. I count on your continued support to the India-US partnership. When I was here in 2016, I said that our relationship is prime for a momentous future. That future is today. Thank you once again, Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, and the distinguished members of this honor. God bless America. Jai Hind. Long live India-US friendship. Thank you.